If in, in case anybody heard the talk last night, uh, last afternoon, uh, this is going to be a generalization of that. That talk was about how languages expressed events of motion. And uh, the, the, the way to introduce the, the present topic is to, l let me give an example of, a, of two ways to express the same event of motion. Um, both in English. One, you, on the one hand, you might say something like, um, the rock moved down the hill, bouncing in the process, or, or moved down the hill um, as it bounced, something like that. It's not great English, but it's, it's possible. Um, as against, the rock, the rock bounced down the hill. Now, the first of these is two separate clauses, namely the 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 rock bounced, the rock moved down the hill. That's the event of motion, the translational motion that it exhibited, where I'm going to call the rock the figure. I mean, I, I did call the rock the figure. And the, the, um, the hill would be the, the, the ground. So there's a figure and a ground. Um, and, um, and it's occupying the main clause. Uh, so this is a, the first version is a complex sentence in the traditional terminology, which consists of a, a main clause and a subordinate clause uh, with a relationship between the two. So uh, the main clause is something like the rock moved down the hill. And then something like uh, the rock was bouncing in the process is the subordinate clause, which I call the co-event. So there's the first thing is the motion event. The proper, the pro motion event proper. The second is the co-event, which could be in some relationship to the motion event. It could have the relationship of manner or of cause and a number of others, precursion and so forth. Um, and what typically happens in an English type of language and in Chinese is um, that in effect, I'm not suggesting this happens cognitively, but in effect, the verb from the uh, co-event, in this case bounce, moves over, jumps over, and combines with the, the move verb here. So you get move as if you were getting move while bouncing, all of which conflates into a single surface verb, bounce. And you wind up with a single clause, the rock bounced down the hill. So it turns out that this is a major pattern where the same uh, circumstance, the same situation, can be represented in two different ways, either as a main clause, either as a complex sentence consisting of a main clause and a subordinate clause with a relationship from the one to the other, um, which in effect represent a, uh, a motion event, a co-event, and the relationship between them. Or the whole thing can conflate it's a term I use, uh, can conflate, into a single clause, as if, uh, so that the same circumstance can be uh, represented either as this complex sentence or as a simple s single clause w into which all the relevant information has been collapsed into a single form. Um, and I'm calling this kind of situation uh, a macro event. A macro event is one that can be could be so analyzed as to consist of a main event and a subordinate event uh, with a relation, or either that or as a, a collapsed single event. So that's the macro event. And it turns out that, so that in a sense, that's what we dealt with the last talk. It turns out that where I, where, then I only spoke about a motion event, uh, an event like the, the rock moved down the hill. But it turns out that this generalizes. And this whole structure, this whole relationship between a complex sentence or uh, event, stru event structure and a single clause or collapsed event structure um, generalizes and can, can be seen to hold for four further um, kinds of events. Not only a motion event, like the rock moved on the hill, but also an event that I call uh, temporal contouring. I'll be going through each of these in turn. 
temporal contouring, um, state change, change of state, something I'm calling action correlating, and finally, something I'm calling realization. And it turns out that all five of these uh, types of circumstance uh, behave alike. Um, in, in particular, in a certain way. Each of these, let me start with the, the motion event, uh, the, the first type. The motion event is, is probably the prototype, and the others seem to follow it. L languages seem to um, model uh, their, these additional four types of situations, uh, types of base, uh, main events, uh, on the motion event in, in some kind of abstract metaphoric way. It, it turns out that uh, all of these uh, types, these five types, exhibit a kind of typology, a two-way typology. Uh, languages, perhaps exhaustively, perhaps, no, probably not exhaustively, but um, uh, largely fall into two categories on the following basis. Uh, within the, the motion event, and by the way, I'm going to be calling the generalization, here's the motion event, like the rock moved on the hill. The generalization of that I'm going to call the framing event. So the framing event will be, so there will be the framing event, the co-event, and the relation that the co-event has to the framing event. So that's the, my new term, which generalizes over motion. It's going to, the framing event is now going to cover motion and, and all the other things, I, the other four things I mentioned. Well, within this uh, framing event, uh, I'll, and I'll use the motion event as an, as an example, there's a special portion of it, which I call the core schema, the core schema, which consists either of the path, the, frame, the motion event consists of the figure, fact of motion, path, and the ground object. Um, the, uh, the path alone, or the path together with the ground, constitutes the core schema. So, and a, the, the typology that I'm proposing depends on where this core schema shows up in a language characteristically. And there's two main places it shows up characteristically. Either it shows up in the verb, in which, which I would call, call languages of that sort a verb-framed language, or it shows up in the satellite, and I'm going to call that a satellite-framed language. Uh, English and Chinese are... Sat so, so the satellite-framed languages include most of Indo-European languages, so that's like English and all the familiar European languages, except for Romance, not Romance. Um, it includes Finno-Ugric, languages like Finnish and Hungarian. Um, in, it, it includes Chinese, but you're welcome to argue with me about this. Um, and includes Ojibwa and several, in like an American Indian language, and several other languages. It's probably the second most common um, a typological category in this in this uh, typology. The the other one is probably the the, the commonest one. The um, oh, I guess I should say what a satellite is. Well, for, the other one is the verb frame language. Um, the verb frame languages include Romance languages such as Spanish and Polynesian and Semitic uh, and Japanese and Korean. It's it's probably the most extensive. And um, uh, the, uh, so again, they're determined by where the core schema shows up. So, and I'll be illustrating all this in a second. I'm just a little bit of introduction in, in an abstract way. A satellite, so the core schema either shows up in the verb, in the surface sentence, or it shows up in a satellite. What's a satellite? Um, a satellite is, any, is, any, is a constituent that um, is in immediate construction with the verb root, with the verb, that's not a noun phrase or a prepositional phrase. So it would be like an English particle, like for example, to run in or run down or run up. Those are satellites. And in Chinese, they would be the second, second verb, the resultative verb that you have. That, I would call that a, a satellite. So uh, let me start then, pro pro progress through these five different types. So I'll start with the, the, the basic one, the prototype one, which is exactly what I covered yesterday, and I'll just give a shortened version of what I dealt with extensively yesterday. Uh, and that's the, um, 
the, the case where the framing event is, in fact, a motion event, an event of motion or of location, either one. Uh, so the examples, it, it, the, we can start some examples, and what I'll do is I'll contrast, I'll systematically throughout this talk contrast um, the two language types, the two typological types, uh, a language which is uh, uh, satellite framed and a language which is verb framed. So, for example, uh, you can take a sentence like, the, uh, in English, the English sentence, which is satellite framed, the bottle floated into the cave. So here's a cave, here's some water, here's a bottle, and it floated into the cave. Um, so here the, uh, the, the satellite is in, or into, if you, I, I mean, typically, if you really do it right, it's the satellite plus the preposition, so, which collapse in English, in this case, into, into. So um, into represents this path, this geometric path. Here's, a, here's an enclosure from outside the enclosure to in the enclosure. So that's into. Um, and uh, with the core schema represented uh, in this satellite, then you can ask, well, where is the co-event expressed? The co-event, in this case, is, is floating. The, the full uh, sentence, the sentence based on a, uh, when regarded as a complex sentence, would be something like, the bottle moved into the cave with the manner of the bottle was floating, or the bottle was afloat on the water. So then you take this float thing, stick it over, jump it over here to move, and you, you wind up saying the bottle floated into the cave. So the, the co-event, which has the floating thing, and in this case has the relationship of manner to the framing event, it shows up in the verb. So in a satellite-framed language, the path, in the case of a motion event, the path um, characteristically shows up in the satellite, like floated in, the in part, and the, the co-event, the floating part, shows up in the verb. This, this much is just like Chinese. Um, um, now you look to Spanish or to Japanese, and they cannot say it this way. They have to say it, and uh, Spanish must say it to, to capture the same meaning, must say the bottle entered the cave, entered to the cave floating. Uh, in Spanish, which I don't, my accent is, is not great, but here it is. It's something like la botella entró a la cueva flotando. And you can stick the flotando in, inside to make it a single clause. So it too has a single clause. So you can say la botella entró flotando a la cueva. The bottle entered floating to the cave. Um, that's the same way. So now what they've done is they've put the, um, the path, the, which is the core schema for, for a motion event, uh, into the verb. The verb means to enter. Uh, so that's why I call it verb framed. English is satellite framed. The path shows up in the satellite. The bottle floated in. That's the verb, that's the satellite. In Spanish, it's the bottle entered. So the, the path shows up in the verb. It's a path verb. So English has a path satellite. Spanish has a path verb. Um, and then you're, you're, uh, since they have occupied the verb with the, um, with the path, the path has gone at the verb, then you can ask, well, where has the co-event gone? And whereas in English, the co-event went into the verb, the verb is now occupied. In Spanish, the co-event goes into some kind of ger gerund type of form, like flotando, floating. Or it could be some kind of prepositional phrase, or, or typically it's actually just dropped because it's kind of awkward to include. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that, this is an example where there's no agent, and the, what I'm calling the um, support relation, the relation of the subordinate event to the main event, the co-event to the framing event, is one of manner. You can also have one where the support, the, the support relationship is, is one of um, cause. So uh, the, an example in English would be the bone pulled loose from its socket. So you know, here's a bone, here's the socket, bone pulled loose from its socket, or pulled, I'll say pulled out, pulled out of its socket. So again, if you, if you think of this in terms of the, um, 
uh, complex sentence format, then it would be structured something like the bone moved out of its socket with the cause of, now it's with the cause of, not the manner of, with the cause of, that's the support relation, something pulled on the bone. So something external pulled on the bone. And again, as an English uh, style, you can, in effect, I'm not saying this actually happens, but as if the verb from the co-event jumps over, combines with in the main event, and you get the bone pulled out of its socket. Perfectly good English sentence. Um, uh, Spanish, again, cannot say that. Uh, once again, English is putting the, um, the, pa the path part, the core schema, the path part, in the satellite. The bone moved out, so it's the out part. And the, the co-event is sh showing up in the verb. The bone pulled out of its socket. Um, in, um, in Spanish, uh, you, to, since it's verb framed, you put the framing constituent, the, the, the core event, the, um, uh, the, the core schema, uh, or in this, in this case the path, uh, into the verb. And the verb in Spanish is going to be went out. So it's se salió. Is salirse is it, um, it, it's, this, um, it's, it's this spatial uh, concept. So it <clears throat> means it, it moved out, all in one verb. They have a special verb for to move out. So you say, el hueso se salió. Uh, so the, the bone moved out, exit, exited from, the, from its place, de su sitio. And then, then you have to, we're, so now its co-event is going to have to be expressed elsewhere. In this case, uh, something like, uh, these two sentences were um, without an agent. The same phenomenon takes place if you add the whole agentive semantic complex, where there's an agent which uh, performs certain actions, which then bring about these, these same things I've been talking about, the, either the complex event or the simplex event. The, the conflated event. Um, so you could have things like, um, in English you would say, I um, uh, rolled, okay, with a, with, where the support relationship is one of manner, you could have something like, I rolled the barrel out of the storeroom. So seen uh, as um, uh, a, uh, a complex construction, it would be something like, I moved, I agentively moved, I write capital move with a capital subscript A to show that it's agentive now, not, not autonomous, but agentive. Um, I agentively moved. I moved the uh, barrel uh, out of the storeroom. This much is the motion event. With the manner of, it's still manner, or it's again manner, um, I rolled the barrel, or the barrel rolled, either one, I don't care. Um, again, we put roll, so now it's the barrel that's rolling, that's its manner. So again, we can take the roll, put it in here, and we get, I rolled the barrel out of the storeroom. I mean, just to make sure you know, we know what the English sentence means, here's a, a storeroom, here's a barrel. It means I'm in the storeroom, and I go like that to the barrel, and as I roll it, it moves out of the storeroom. Okay, that's what the sentence means. Spanish, again, has to put the, uh, the core schema, the path, in the verb. And they have a verb which is agentive. It means to agentively move uh, out, to cause to move out, which is um, sacar. So you can say, I moved, I extruded. I mean, English has a, has a fake sort of verb. Nobody uses it, which means something like cause to move out. So I extruded the barrel from the, from the storeroom. Uh, rolling it. So you'd say, saqué el barril del, de la bodega, uh, rolándolo, rolándolo, rolling it. And one more example. Uh, we've now got agent. Now let's try where the support relationship is one of um, uh, cause. So this English sentence would be something like, I kicked the ball into the box. Well, uh, seen as a uh, complex, it, this would be something like, I agentively moved, I caused to move the ball, I agentively moved the ball into the box 
with the cause of I kicked the ball. And again, kick goes in, shows over here, and you get I kicked the ball into the box. So that's the conflated uh, single clause way of saying this otherwise rather complex uh, construction or c conception. Um, again, uh, English puts the, the core schema, in this case the path, since it's a motion event, into the satellite. So I, uh, it was out a second ago, now it's in. Uh, and uh, puts the, the uh, scheme, the, co the uh, co event into the verb. Spanish, once again, puts the path in the verb. So they have an agentive path, which means to cause to enter. And it would be, it's, namely, it's uh, meter. Uh, so it's agentively move into, something into. So, meti, uh, what is it? El, la pelota uh, a la caja de un pedazo, I guess, with a kick. Um, so it means I inserted the ball to the box with a kick. Okay, except it's not really in English insert, which doesn't quite mean the same thing. So, uh, okay, so this is in effect a, a recap of yesterday's talk, but now it's just uh, forming one portion of a five-way pattern. So now let's move on to number two, which is temporal contouring. Um, and I'm, temporal contouring is essentially the same thing as aspect, but I have devised a, a special term because uh, to, to, to refer to the case where aspect, uh, in, in other words, temporal pattern, can be seen as, can be uh, conceptualized as a separable event in its own right, one that can be abstracted away as a distinct event in its own right, and represented separately by, for example, a verb. Um, well, uh, here we have a, a really extensive and beautiful contrast between a verb-framed language and a satellite-framed language between Spanish and German. Uh, English doesn't do so well here. I mean, it's, it's mixed. English is mixed. Since English borrowed so many romance words, I mean, I should have pointed it out, English, I did, as I did yesterday, um, English has all these verbs like to exit, to enter, to cross, to pass, and so forth. And the reason is because it borrowed them from romance, where it's the na native type. Well, English has also borrowed some aspectual verbs from romance, like to continue and uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, what else, finish, uh, and to used to, and so forth. So, but, so English is kind of a mixed type, but German is, is pretty pure. And again, we're going to find that um, Spanish uses the main verb to um, express the temporal contour. Ten of them I've got listed here. I'm not going to go through all ten. And in each case, German uses something other than the verb. It uses either a satellite, a true satellite, or at least it uses something outside the verb, like a, a, an adverb or something of that sort. So, for example, um, uh, the, the easiest one to look at is uh, I finished writing the letter. Because English, in this case, has both forms. Uh, you can, in English, you can either say, I finished writing the letter, or I wrote the letter to completion, or I wrote the letter to a finish. Um, we have both styles. Uh, the, whereas Spanish has uh, only the first, as far as I know, and uh, German has only the second. So in this case, Spanish has a verb to finish, terminar. So you can say, terminé de escribir la carta. I finished to, uh, from writing or the letter. And German would have to say, uh, ich habe den, den Brief uh, fertig geschrieben. I, I wrote the letter to completion. The, the fertig there is, is a satellite, a true satellite. It's showing up as a prefix to the verb schreiben, write. So it means I, I completion wrote, I completion wrote the letter, something like that. Um, the second type is, uh, is to, again, is repeat. Again, Spanish uh, 
expresses the notion of iteration of do, repeating something in its main verb. Uh, it's, again, it's a verb framed language. So if you want to say, I saw him again, you'd say, Lo volvi a ver. I repeated to see him. Literally, it's I, re I returned to see him. I repeated to see him. Whereas um, German would, again, in its type, which is satellite framed, will, will place its, um, the repeat notion in the satellite. And you'll say, Ich habe ihn wieder gesehen. I have him re-seen, again seen, re-seen. The re in English is a perfect example of it. The re is a, is a satellite, is a separate morpheme, um, uh, which indicates uh, uh, repetition. So in this case, English uh, has that kind of thing. Um, a third type, in English, you, you might say something like, uh, I just ate. Uh, well, that concept, that aspectual tense or aspectual kind of concept, is expressed again in Spanish as a main verb. It's acabar de. So you'd say, acabo de comer. I have justed or <laughs> to eat. I mean, you can't say it in English. Um, and um, and in, uh, in German, it would be Ich uh, habe gerade gegessen. Is that it? Ich ha no. Yeah. Or ich, yeah, ich habe gerade gegessen. Um, I have just eaten. I mean, it's sort of pretty much the same as English. So in any case, the 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 concept of um, repetition shows up in the, again in the main verb in uh, in Spanish, uh, but in the satellite in in German, or at least not in the verb. It shows up in an adverb. Uh, the same goes for the concept of um, to continue. Um, again, English has um, both types. Uh, you could say, I, she continued to sleep, or I don't know, he's, I'm, he's continuing to sleep, or he's still sleeping. You can say, have, have both types. But um, Spanish has to use the, uh, well, I don't know if they have to, but anyway, they have the option of, using the main verb, which is seguir, to follow, uh, to mean to, to keep on, continue. So um, you have uh, uh, sigue durmiendo, he continues to sleep. And German would, would now again say something like, er schläft, er schläft noch, he sleeps still, so he's still sleeping. Um, and then the last one I'll go through is, um, is the one that would mean habitually. So I habitually eat meat. So uh, again, uh, Spanish has a whole verb, which means to habitually. So it's suelo, soler is the verb, suelo comer carne, carne. I habituate, the, the, you can't say it in English. Um, I, uh, so hab habituates to eat meat, something like that. And German would have to say, uh, again, with an adverb, immer, uh, would have to say something like, normalerweise, usually, as a rule, um, es ich Fleisch, es ich Fleisch. Um, as a rule, I eat meat. As it happens, English here has a specific, uh, the construction, the simple present, which means this habitual, like, I eat meat, as opposed to, I am eating meat. So, I eat meat is the habitual. And in the past, Again, Spanish would use the same verb in, in, with the past forms, um, solía comer carne. And German would now say, früher habe ich immer Fleisch gegessen. So er, previously, I always ate meat. And here, English has a, a, a special form for it used to, which it borrowed from romance. Use is a, romantic, is a romance word. Um, so uh, we have a rather nice demonstration of how uh, temporal contouring, a uh, form of aspect, is uh, following the same typological pattern that path is in an event of motion. Uh, the, the same Spanish, as we saw in the motion case, was a um, verb-framed language. It put the, it it puts the, habitually puts the core schema in the, in the verb. It did so when the core schema was the path 
in, a, uh, in an event of motion, as we saw, and it's doing it again, it, in, it's putting the aspectual, the temporal contour in the main verb in uh, an event of, um, of, uh, of temporal contouring. Uh, whereas German, which is pretty much like English, uh, uh, is a satellite framed language, and it puts the uh, temporal contour in the, uh, in the satellite. In, in all of these, I hope that you're thinking along with parallels with Chinese, because as I understand it, uh, a lot of aspectual markers are also uh, placed in the second, in V2, the second verb. Um, so, in, in other words, Chinese is acting pretty much like German and English. It's consistent. Uh, if, if you agree that it is satellite framed, um, then in, um, in the spatial cases, um, if you say something like the ball rolled in, I, I won't try to say it, but I do know that you say something like the ball, ball roll and then jin, right? Uh, jin, jin, okay. So the jin is the uh, in part. I mean, it, it's still functioning. It still functions as the main verb, which is the the crucial issue. Is it acting as a second verb, or is it already becoming? Is it starting to grammaticalize that second position and starting to become something like the English satellite system? I mean, that's that's one of the big questions. But uh, in any case, it's um, it's it, it, it's. Wherever it shows up, where the path shows, the path shows up in second position, and so does a lot of uh, of aspect, as I understand it in Chinese. Like uh, I ate finished. What is it? One or something? Uh, two, two. No, I two one. The one the one would be then second position. So it's in exactly the same position as the um, as the uh, in would go. So that so it's parallel. Okay. The uh, third kind of um, uh, uh, event is an event of state change where the, you change states. And the metaphor seems to be that something like um, the, the, the metaphor that in effect languages are operating by is that um, just as some object can move, uh, some figure object can move from one ground object to another, so some entity can, sh can change from one property to another, from one state to another. That seems to be the, the underlying abstractive metaphor. So <clears throat> to be start this off, um, it works better for uh, English-speaking audiences if I do this. There are some uh, state, change, state change constructions in English, like to death, is one of them, which look on the surface like a path plus a ground uh, construction. So it's easier to start with them, and because they sort of more or less they more explicitly demonstrate the parallelism, this metaphoric parallelism between state change and uh, and uh, uh, location change. So. Um, uh, and so the, here's an example, which uh, again you can have in two different ways in English. One is um, you could say if you look at it from the more complicated way, uh, you could say something like he moved to death, and I'm putting move in quotes. It is in quotes, I hope, in my in my handout, to indicate that it's metaphorical. It's a metaphorical move, not a literal motion. He moved to death uh, with the cause of he. Uh, choked on a bone. In, in English, you say on there. He choked on a bone. Um, so it means you get a bone stuck in your throat and you're choking. <laughs> That's, you can hardly breathe. Okay. Well, you could either uh, conflate each clause separately and say something like, he died, so he moved to death, he died, from choking on a bone. So that would be the two clause way of saying it. Or, you could take the choke verb once more, jump it over to the first clause, and say something like, he choked to death on a bone. Uh, in fact, the on a bone thing 
is left there, and the fact that it's on shows that it's triggered by the use of the verb choke, because choke kind of idiosyncratically takes this preposition on in English. Um, okay, so, uh, so, but in any case, you, could, you have this kind of to death, if you do conflate it like that, and have the single clause representation, you, can, you then have a single clause like he choked to death on a bone. And the to death indicates the state of change from life to death, from aliveness to dead to death. Um, well, how would Spanish represent this? See, now here, English is representing the core schema. Now, in the, in the state change type of event, the core schema is now going to be the changed state. In, it was, in the motion event, it was the path. In the temporal contouring, it was the temporal contour. In a state change kind of event, it's the, um, it's the uh, changed state. So the changed state, the core event, the core schema, shows up, sure enough, uh, as a uh, preposition plus noun, as, as like a, looking like a into the box kind of construction. Um, and as usual in English, the co-event shows up in the verb. So you get he choked to death. The, the to death uh, is the uh, core schema representing the, the framing event, the, the, the main event that happened, namely the guy died. So Spanish, typical for its typological category, expresses the fact of the framing event, the core schema, in its main, in its verb. So namely, you have to say, he died. There's no alternative to this, he died. That's what the verb has to say. In English, you can say, he choked. But in Spanish, you have to say, he died. Then if you want to say the co-event, the, the cause of his death, you can then add on this additional phrase, say, for example, atragantado, atragantado por un hueso, choked by a bone, something like that. Um, so again, Spanish, does it separately, and I assume that Chinese does it like English. Uh, I'd probably say choke, die, or something like that. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, so um, uh, another, so in, in just to ca gradually break in, since English here has into death, uh, it turns out that German has a, for the same concept, has a genuine satellite. It's an inseparable prefix on the verb root. It's the prefix is er, and it, it essentially means to death. If you stick it with uh, squeeze, which is what, uh, quetschen, I guess. Uh, quetschen just means to squeeze, but er quetschen means to squeeze someone to death. So that's what, it's the same thing, except German is like English, except it represents this... Um, um, satellite framing of the result of the, of, the, of the state change, of the changed state, in, its, um, uh, in, a, in one of these uh, satellites as is insever inseparable prefixes. Um, but since we're on these, uh, there, there's another one. Uh, German has another air. I gave it a different subscript, which essentially translates like into one's possession. Now it turns out that English does not have uh, the, the nice English type construction for this. If you want to say something like the, the complex, if the complex form is the army uh, moved the peninsula into its possession with the cause of it fought, it battled, it fought. You cannot say in English, it's not good English to say, the army fought the peninsula into its possession. That's bad English. But it would be nice if we had that construction. Um, it turns out that English, in this case, is limited. It has to resort to a Spanish type of construction. All that English can say is the army won the peninsula uh, by, with a, well, that's, we could just stop there, won the peninsula. Um, uh, but German does continue on the satellite-framed languages type of construction, 
The German says, essentially, the army uh, fought the peninsula into its possession. He said, the army had sich, had to, had to itself, the Halbinsel uh, erkämpft. Another example of that sort is the workers um, moved into the, moved a pay raise into their possession with the cause of they struck. Well, again, you can't say in English the workers uh, struck a pay raise into their possession. It's not good English. All you can say is the workers won a pay raise by striking. So English has to switch to the Spanish type construction. It, it falls short here. But German does. It just goes right on and says, with this er prefix, it says essentially the, uh, the workers, well, the workers struck a pay raise into their, into their possession. The Arbeiter haben sich eine Lohnerhöhung erstreicht, something like that. Uh, so now let me do a bit more, state change a bit more systematically uh, with, with uh, both a particular kind of state change, which is going, uh, change of existence, either going out of existence or coming into existence. So the state change is first, the first one will be pre from presence to absence, going from being in existence to being out of existence. And again, we'll see that this kind of state change is expressed in, um, in satellite frame languages in the satellite. And here English is pretty good. So, for example, you can say out uh, in one of its uses. I mean, everything is polysemous. I mean, there isn't a single morpheme here that doesn't have more than one meaning. So one of the meanings of out in English um, as a satellite is to extinguishment for flames and fires and candles and so forth, so, or, or lights. Uh, so, uh, if, the, if the thing were conceptualized in its uh, more complex format, you might say, I, no, let's see, the, the candle moved, in quotes, metaphorically moved, uh, to extinguishment with, with the manner of, here we can get a manner, with the manner of, it flickered uh, or spluttered. And you can say, then again, it, you, you can either say, well, no, the, the candle extinguished, flickering, which is not good English, I mean, it's not great English, um, or you can do the usual satellite thing and put the word, ex the, the co-event concept of flickering into the main verb and say the candle flickered out. Out now is a satellite that stands for into extinguishment. That's what it means in this case. So the candle flickered out means the candle extinguished flickering as it did so, flickering in the process. Flickering is just like that. Um, and um, uh, you can also have it with, with the support event as one of cause. So you could say uh, if you had the, the candle uh, moved into extinguishment with the cause of something blew on it, like oh, some wind, again you could say the candle blew out just like uh, the napkin blew off the table. You could say the, ca the candle blew out, uh, meaning the candle extinguished um, as a result of something blowing on it, the wind blowing on it. Spanish, of course, uh, could not say this. Uh, they would have to put the, uh, the extinguishment part, the, the core schema, the changed state, into the main verb. And so they, they would have to say the candle extinguished with, from whatever man, with whatever manner or cause. So you have to say la, la candela, la candela, uh, se, apagó, se apagó, I guess, yeah, extinguished itself. Uh, uh, con el viento, I guess, with the wind. It means from the wind. So uh, again, it uh, uses the verb to express its uh, um, main, it, it's uh, the core schema uh, of change of state, the changed state, and uh, so forth. Okay, another example of uh, going from presence to absence, English has another nice one that's a nice distinction, it's away, which means um, gradually disappear, 
uh, due to some um, natural process. Um, so uh, you can say things like uh, the uh, meat rotted away. That means the meat moved disappearance, moved gradually to disappearance with the cause of the meat was rotting. So if you say the meat rotted away, if you look, you know, if you had put a piece of meat on the table and come back three weeks later, all you're going to see is a brown stain, then you can say the meat rotted away. It means it disappeared gradually as a result of rotting. Okay. Similarly, you can say um, uh, the hinge rusted away, so there used to be a hinge on the door, it got rusty, 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 just a bunch of powder down there, the hinge rusted away. The picture faded away, there was a delineation on the picture frame, now you look come back and you see nothing there. Um, and uh, the, the, my, my sleeves, the, my elbows, uh, the elbows of my sleeves wore away, means they disappeared gradually from wear on them. This is from wear meaning wear and tear, not wearing a shirt, but abrasion. So, uh, and then to make a, a contrast with Spanish, you can say something like the leaves withered away. It means they disappeared gradually by withering. And all that uh, Spanish can say is the leaves um, de de destroyed themselves, uh, no, uh, disintegrated, the leaves disintegrated by drying. Again, they have to put the changed state, the fact of disintegration, in the main verb. English is putting it in this satellite away. It's gone. The gone part is in the away. Spanish has to put it in the, in the okay, verb. So that, maybe that's all I'll do for uh, going out of existence. How about coming into existence? Um, the, um, uh, so that would, in English, uh, also does this well. And that, uh, it uses up, uh, uh, the, the satellite up has many different meanings. And uh, I think you're better off if you start off trying to isolate the separate meanings instead of bunching them all together as if there were one thing running through them. I, I doubt if there is. So, and this is one of the ups, which means um, uh, into existence. So for example, if you say, uh, I, it, let's say you have a, to Xerox is to photocopy. So you have an original letter, and you want to make some copies. So you put it on the Xerox machine. Well, you can say, uh, I Xeroxed the original letter. That's fine. But you cannot say, I Xeroxed up the original letter. But you must say, or almost must say, I Xeroxed up three copies of the original letter. It means I created three copies of the original letter by Xeroxing it. So the underlying thing is, I moved into uh, existence, therefore moved, I moved three copies into existence, therefore moved up, uh, with the cause of I Xeroxed the original. So I Xeroxed up three copies of the... Similarly with boil, you, you, can, you can't boil up some water because uh, you haven't created anything. But you can boil up some coffee. Uh, you can create coffee, by boiling water and coffee grounds. Um, similarly, think up, uh, thought up a plan, means to create a plan by thinking about, by thinking. You can't think a plan. So it, to think up a plan means I'm, in effect, in my sort of quasi-translation, uh, I moved a plan into existence, where into existence is represented by up as a satellite, I moved into existence uh, a plan by, with the cause of, I thought about things, so I thought the, uh, the plan up. Um, again, Spanish couldn't say any of these things. Um, so that's, I think that's enough for bringing, that's enough for bringing into existence. Uh, and then there's uh, a whole set of things for just, just uh, odd, uh, uh, various languages of all sorts of, uh, or satellite, uh, satellite languages, especially, which are the, the, in this case, the interesting ones, because, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive. What I'm essentially saying is that in satellite-framed languages, like Chinese and English, the, it's, the, it's the second part, and English is perhaps even more counterintuitive, because the second part is not a verb. Its second part is some particle. 
Uh, it's like up and away and out. Um, and uh, that is the part of the sentence which carries the weight of the whole framing event. I mean, that's what's so strange about it. Um, it's the thing that determines, as we'll see later, it's the, it's the part of the sentence, not the verb, which you might have thought. It's, yes, it's the verb in, the, in Spanish that does all these things, but in English, and in Chinese, but in, in English it's even more peculiar. Um, it's this little strange satellite, not a verb, uh, this particle thing that determines the, uh, the argument structure and the aspect and, and the negation. It's, it's determinative. That's why I call it the framing event. And I call it, it's the locus of the core schema of the whole framing event. I, I call it the framing constituent. Uh, and also, all, all, it's pivotal in the sentence, um, even though it's so innocuous. So that's why it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, well, anyway, the uh, various um, of these uh, uh, satellite-framed languages, like, which include you know, Russian and German and so forth, have rather peculiar uh, meanings, framing event meanings, tied up in their little particles. So uh, first, let me just do one that, uh, I don't know why I like it. Oh, yeah, because I have a contrast with Spanish. There's another meaning of up, which in English means to, um, to destruction. So is that what I, it's, it's the, uh, with the dog chewing on the, on the shoe. Uh, so in English, you can say the dog chewed on the shoe for 20 minutes. So there's no, here's the, if you say chew on. So here's the shoe, dog, chew, 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 chew. Nothing happens to the shoe. No state change. But you can say the dog, chew, the dog chewed the shoe up in, yeah, I think I, I have to step back for a second because I, I need it for later. Um, the popcorn example. Uh, I want to use the case where it goes out of existence. I, I skipped one where the, um, I, ate, I ate the popcorn and I ate the popcorn up. I just want to go back to that because um, I use it later. Uh, th this is the log burned and the log burned up. So up, in this case, is another one of the four or five ups I've got here, which means to uh, consumption, to, to consumedness, to consumedness. So the, the log burned for, 30 minute, for 20 minutes before I decided to put it out. But the log burned up in 30 minutes means the log moved to consumedness up with the cause of it burned. So that means if you said the log burned up in 30 minutes, it means it's gone, no more log. And uh, same with popcorn. If you say I ate popcorn, here's a bowl of popcorn. If you say I ate popcorn for 20 minutes, fine, there's still popcorn. But if you say I ate the popcorn up in 30 minutes, no more popcorn. So it means I moved it to consumedness, all gone. Okay, so. Let me return now to this dog so, in the shoe. In, in English, you can say I, the, the dog chewed on the shoe for 20 minutes, but the dog chewed the shoe up in 30 minutes. It means the dog chewed the shoe to, to non-attackness, I think. 174. 174. The dog chewed the, I means the dog moved the shoe to a state of non-attackness with the cause of the dog chewed on the, the dog chewed on the shoe. So again, you get chew, jumping over, and you, and you have um, the dog chewed the shoe up in 30 minutes. In German, this ha German has a special uh, satellite for this. It's kaput. Uh, what is it? Kaputgebissen, something like that. Um, okay, well, Spanish, again, has to say something like the dog destroyed the shoe chewing on it. There's, it has no alternative. So in the first case, if you want to say the dog chewed on the shoe for 20 minutes, fine. Spanish uses its main verb for chewing. The dog chewed on the shoe for, has the chewing verb, mordesquiar. But as soon as you say English keeps chew in the, in the verb, the dog chewed the shoe up in 30 minutes, well, now Spanish has to change its verb because the verb has to... Uh, represent the framing event, which is now that of uh, non moving to a state of non-intactness. 
So the, therefore, the, in Spanish, you have to say the dog destroyed the shoe, chewing on it, chewing on it. So let me just get the Russian example. Uh, if you skip down there, can you see the Russian example? So Russian has this, uh, it, all of its satellites are prefixes on the verb. They, they never leave the verb um, as separate morphemes. And Russian has this very nice uh, prefix za with the reflexive, which means, and this is all my translation, which means something like to get uh, attentionally absorbed in something to such a degree that you miss something else that, you're, that you're, you would otherwise be concerned about. That's what it means. <laughs> so for example, if, uh, you, if, if you, the verb you use is to read, um, let's say you're reading along and somebody calls your name and calls you and you, you don't respond. All of a sudden you hear them and you say, oh, sorry, ya zacitalse. Means I uh, got absorbed in reading to the point where I missed hearing what you're calling me. Um, and literally it might be, the, the framing event is I got, I got engrossed, um, intentionally engrossed to the point of missing you, that's all the za part, uh, with instantiation by, I was reading. Or maybe with the cause of, I don't know. I was reading, that's the, that's the co-event. I was the reading part. Another example is Yeza Spenterelsia actually was walking next to someone uh, who said this. Uh, we were walking along and he was gonna uh, go to his house but he passed it by because he kept watching somebody in front of him. Uh, so he, he actually walked past his own house because he was so absorbed in watching the person in front of him. He said, oh, excuse me, yes, um, that's I got absorbed uh, to the point of missing what I was, would be concerned with, with, be, with the cause of I was looking at something. So I looked myself into missing, something like that. Um, Okay, so the, uh, I don't know if Chinese has that one, <laughs> but I'm sure you have. If you had it, it would have to be I, I look, second verb, I look, miss, or something like that. Uh, you'd have to tell me if you have it. But, but I'm sure that uh, you have many other interesting ones. Uh, languages are um, choosing to represent this C. And it's like it's a, the agency does something, it performs a certain kind of action, and the agent um, correlates her actions with those of the agency. And there's several kinds of correlation. The correlation can be she does it in concert with the agent, with the agency, so that it's like together. She does it in accompaniment with it, so like this is the main thing, but she is ancillary, this is main, secondary. She does it she, in imitation of him, of, of the agency. So here's the agency, performs its action, she watches and imitates it. It could be she, uh, she does it in surpassment. Here's this, this agency does a certain action, she does the same action but better. And there's a f another fourth, fifth type, which I, I think I'll skip because it's slightly complicated. So um, to illustrate, the, and then the, 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 it, the core event, the framing event, is this very process that this agent undergoes of putting this same or similar action into correlation with, into one, into one or another kind of correlation with this action. That process of putting it into correlation, that's the, uh, that's the framing event. And what shows up in the verb, and, and, and that type of, the, the type of correlation, one of the five uh, that I just mentioned, is what shows up in the satellite, in a satellite frame language, and in the main verb in, in a verb frame language. And in a satellite frame language, the, um, the co-event is what shows up in the verb. is the same pattern. So for example, let's take concert. It would be things like she sang along with him. Or that means he's, he's singing. Or it could be a record. She sang along with the record. Here's a record. That's why I call it an agency, because it doesn't have to be a living agent. 
let's say, a record, or by now, I mean, I'm, my image is um, old opera. So here's old opera playing on a record. So she listens to the old opera and she sings along with the record. Uh, no, it's not, it's not what I want. Uh, okay, it's number two. Number one is together with. So, no, forget all this. That's number two. R remember it in, in a second. <laughs> uh, right now, it's uh, together with. So let's say, um, I played the melody together with him. Or I jog together with him. That means we together form a unit. We are in concert. So, uh, uh, so I jog together with him means we are co-equal. Uh, I played the melody together with him. We are co-equal. We're equal partners in the whole thing. Um, and uh, she sings together with me. Same, same idea. We're, we, we're a duet, therefore. She sings together with me. We're a duet. Um, and uh, the um, Spanish has a way to say that, but they can also say, uh, in Spanish, it's a company, lo acompañan. Compagno, tocando la melodía. Uh, I accompany him in playing the melody in English. It has a very specific, it's not a common word, it's a very specific meaning, but in Spanish it just means to, means the same as do together with, apparently. Um, so, uh, okay, the next, uh, I'm move the series where it's progressively less integrated, uh, more at a greater remove the agent is from the agency. So this is where they're co-equal, that's in concert. Next is where it's in accompaniment. So that's the second, the, what I started off with. So let's say, if I say, I jog together with him, we arrange the jogging programs together. But if I say I jog together, uh, along with him, I jog along with him, it means he's the main jogger, he's gonna go jogging every day, and I will join him sometimes. So I jog along with him means I'm somehow secondary, subsidiary. Um, she sings along with us, she sang along with us means we were the main group, she joined us as a secondary uh, member. Uh, I, played, uh, I played the melody along with him, he's the main guy, he's on the piano, I have my saxophone, I play along with her. That's where she sang along with the record, let's say. Okay, the third one, English doesn't have, uh, and German, but German does, and it's uh, to imitate. So uh, English here has to, oh, and I should have said with Spanish. Uh, so let's go to the third one, and that's, um, uh, so English has to revert to, or resort to the Spanish type of construction and say like I imitated him in playing. Uh, it's possible, maybe you could say, I played along after him, but that doesn't quite do it. Um, and uh, uh, but German does. They would say, I played, I played along after him. Ich habe ihm die Melodie nachgespielt. I, to him, the melody after played. Uh, it means I played along after him. So the the the, thought, the imitation notion is uh, in the satellite again as the satellite to the verb, it's a prefix. Spanish, of course, would then say, I followed him playing the melody. Uh, lo sigue tocando la melodía. Uh, and finally, uh, in surpassment of, is, um, uh, in Eng English has it, to uh, out. And in this case, this, the satellite in English uh, which represents this kind of correlation, shows up as a prefix. So I outplayed him means I surpassed him in playing. So I outplayed him, I outcooked him. Uh, it means I surpassed him. And in this, the, the, this particular construction doesn't permit you to bring along all the other arguments from the original construction. So if you could say I he played the mel melody. You can't say I outplayed him in the melody or anything. You just can only say I outplayed him. Okay, I think I'll leave that stand for the uh, fourth type of action correlating.
which is fitting the path. And what the metaphor is, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it, apparently, languages are treating um, the process of correlating your action with somebody else's as somehow metaphorically comparable to going to going with moving with respect to some reference object. Well, like that makes sense. I guess that's what it is. Okay, uh, fifth one is uh, what I call uh, realization. And uh, this is where Chinese is the master. Yeah. English doesn't have it that much. Um, so, uh, to set up the framework, um, there's, I'm going to give uh, four, there's like a sequence of four uh, ways in uh, the degrees to which things can relate to each other. So realization is the idea that um, uh, some event is, uh, w which is only potential gets realized, gets fulfilled. That's one kind of realization. So something that's only potential gets fulfilled. And another is something that's only assumed gets confirmed. I'm treating both of those under the aegis of realization. And uh, the first type is without realization. There's no realization here. It's just straight. It's neutral to that. So you would, ha and I call what the, so we're going to have four different types of verbs. The first type of verb I call, uh, what do I call it? Intrinsic, yeah, oh, intrinsic fulfillment, yes. Um, and an example would be, in English, the verb kick. So I kicked the hubcap. A hubcap is the center part of a, of a car wheel. So I hit, kicked the hubcap. So here's the hubcap. Here's my foot. And I go. <laughs> so here's the, here's the um, I kicked the hubcap. So, um, uh, so kick intrinsically in English as a verb, not in Chinese, but as a verb in English, it means all of um, to volitionally uh, thrust your leg and foot forward and into impact with something else. So you have to kick it. You kicked something. Uh, it's basically transitive, I guess. Um, and uh, if, in this case, if you add a satellite, uh, the satellite will give you an, an additional bit of information. It won't pertain to this kicking event itself. It'll be something that follow outside the kicking event per se. So if you say kick the hubcap flat, where flat is the extra um, satellite in this case, it means I kicked the hubcap, and as a result, it flattened. So, okay, the hubcap became flat as a result. Um, so I call that that satellite in that case. Uh, what is it, an extra result? There was an extra event or further event satellite. Further event satellite. Okay. Um, the second type is already a type of realization, and this is where um, the verb in itself. Intrinsically, in, a, in the, the very way it's lexicalized, uh, means something like to actually perform certain actions with the intention that those actions will lead to a certain result, a certain goal that you have. So hunt is an example. So the police hunted the fugitive for uh, six days, let's say, whatever. Um, it means they f looked f for tracks, they asked people um, where, uh, it so that's what they actually did with the intention that that should lead to their finding and capturing the fugitive. Right? So that's the potential. It doesn't mean it happened. So if you say the police hunted the fugitive for six days, that's all we, you, you can say, somebody can ask, did they find them? Did they capture them? Uh, you don't know. It's, it's actively 
unknown, and therefore I call it a, a moot fulfillment verb. Moot means it's not clear, it's, not, it's unknown. So it's a moot fulfillment verb. Now if you add a satellite, like the police hunted the fugitive down, the down is a fulfillment satellite. It says that whatever was potential, in fact, got fulfilled. The police, in fact, found and captured the, uh, the fugitive. And now it changes the aspect. The aspect before was uh, an activity. Now it's a, uh, what do you call that? It's an achievement or an accomplishment? It's uh, accomplishment. It means it, you can use in with that. So you can say um, uh, the, um, uh, the police hunted the fugitive down in one week. So you can't reverse those. You can't say the police hunted the fugitive in one week. And you can't say the police hunted the fugitive down for one week. It's, it's quite clear, the, the aspect shifts. Um, so, and that's one of the main types that Chinese has. Most Chinese agent of verbs are of this type, I think. This type or the, or the type that follows. Uh, and English has very few. English has hunt and so forth. So let's go to this, the third type, which is uh, uh, a, uh, implied, implied fulfillment verb. So in this case, an example might be wash. If you say, I washed the shirt, it means that you did certain activities. In this case, you agitated it within soapy water with the intention that that will lead to a certain goal, namely the shirt becomes clean. Uh, uh, but it's, it doesn't say that it actually happens, that it actually happened. Because you can say in English, I washed the shirt, but it came out dirty. It doesn't necessarily mean it was clean. Um, nevertheless, if you simply say in English, I washed the shirt, it's implied, the implicature is that it came out clean. Unlike hunt, if you say the police hunted the fugitive, it's, it, it's definitely moot. I, will, I, will, I can ask you, did they find him? Did they capture him? With wash, the assumption is that it, it got fulfilled. So it's got an implicature in there. Uh, but you can confirm the implicature by adding a satellite. In this case, this would be a confirmation satellite. I washed the shirt clean. Uh, once you say that, you can no longer uh, negate it. You cannot say, I washed the shirt clean, but it came out dirty. Um, now, since this might not be fair, since the word uh, uh, clean automatically means clean, um, there's another example which works a little better, maybe. Uh, it doesn't work for all English speakers, but it works for me. Um, call. If you say, I called uh, her, it's an implicature that you reached her. It means that what you did was, for me it means, you dialed the phone uh, with the intention of thereby telephonically reaching someone, and if you say nothing more, the implication is that you did. So if you say, I called her, and, nothing, and say nothing more, the assumption is she answered. But it's not uh, definitive, because you can defease it. You can say, I called her, but there was no answer. Um, but if you say, I called her up, to me, that means she answered. You can't, in my English, you can't say, I called her up, but there was no answer. So, whereas, I think some English speakers may be yes. Uh, so anyway, that's a similar kind of example. And, and Chinese apparently has verbs of that sort as well. Then, but they're not, they're not numerous in English. Um, finally, there is what I call the attained fulfillment verb, um, which in this case is, um, uh, the example is drown, which means something like to, um, uh, you do certain things with a certain intention that it, something else happens, and in fact it happened. So, in drown someone is to uh, immerse them in water, <clears throat> their head in water, with the intention that that will kill them, and in fact, they die. So you cannot say, if you say, I, the stranger drowned him, you cannot say, but he was still alive. If you say the stranger drowned him, he's dead. 
And in this case, if you try to add a satellite, uh, it would have to, it's what's called pleonastic in linguistics. It means it would simply restate the same meaning that the verb already includes. So, and typically English doesn't like that. So you would not say the stranger drowned him dead or the, you would not say the stranger drowned him to death. That's in fact bad English. Uh, the to death part is already included in drown since it's, a, and since it's an attained fulfillment verb. You don't add a, uh, a satellite which essentially says the same thing. And the fact there's a kind of Klein here, um, you can say, uh, I ch the stranger choked him, but he was still alive when the police arrived. That's fine. And therefore, you can also say the stranger choked him to death. There's only a slight sense of, uh, of fulfillment there, uh, of, of attainment. It's stronger with stab. So it gets harder to say this. With, with, with um, strangle, it's, it's really hard. I mean, so if you say, uh, the stranger strangled him, but he was still alive when the police arrived, well, maybe, just barely. And, um, uh, and, and it's pretty hard to say the stranger strangled him to death. That's pretty bad. But with, in any case, it's, it's still, but it's better in any case than with drown, where it's totally impossible. So there's a kind of like a gradient. Okay, so there. here are some uh, Mandarin examples, uh, which uh, you'll pronounce better than me, so I won't even try. But um, it's um, if you apparently uh, in this. Okay, so if you say, what is it? Well, uh, well, Kailaman, something like that. It's um, uh, it's uh, it's not. It's apparently a. Uh, either, you can tell me, it's either a mood fulfillment verb or a, uh, a implied fulfillment verb. In any case, you can deny it. You can say, Wokailaman Dungshur Menmekai. Okay. Um, but as soon as you add <clears throat> what, uh, a, an additional satellite, what do you say, Wokailaman? Uh, then the second Kai confirms it. It's a confirm confirmation satellite or a fulfillment satellite. I don't know. A native speaker will have to tell me. Uh, similarly, apparently, now apparently some dialects differ on this, but uh, you'll tell me. With kill, sha, is it? Sha. sha. With sha, uh, sha su, yeah. So apparently sha, if you just say well, sharata, it doesn't mean that necessarily that he's dead. It, well, let's see, we've got, let's see, some speakers say no, some say yes. In this one, does anybody think you can say, Ushalata Danshur? Huh? Is that okay? No. Okay, let's have hands. Who says it's okay? How many hands? Here's your hand. Is it anybody? No hands. No hands. That's a bit, okay. Okay, it's not okay. I'm going to scratch that example. But you're okay with the, uh, okay, well, let's try the T example. Uh, uh, by the way, there are speakers who tell me that that's okay. I, the Chinese exist. is in a kind of a, um, a complementary relationship with English because then um, we, we can have almost like a, for, for those speakers who do it this way, an almost perfect um, uh, complementary case. So in English, Kick necessarily refers to completing it all the way there. So what English can do is it can, it's an, it's a, an intrinsic fulfillment verb. And what it, though, it has, though, is it has um, mechanisms you can add to it that cut back. Well, I, my term for it is resecting. It resects a por the last portion of this uh, total uh, action. So that you can say, for example, I kicked out at him, which doesn't mean that your foot hit him. It didn't touch him. I kicked out at him. It, the at, or just I kicked at him, it resects. It doesn't, in fact, it means that you did not hit him. If I grasped the rope, is this. I grasped at the rope, rope means you did not touch the rope. It means you 
tried to but didn't make it. Um, similarly, the um, uh, progressive marker in English does the same thing. You can say, if you say, I opened the wine bottle, that means it's open. But if you say, I was opening the wine bottle when I heard a scream, uh, the, you, we don't know. It's moot. We don't know if you actually opened the bottle or not, if the cork came out of the bottle or not. So the progressive marker does that in English. Um, uh, so the way I had it set up, at least for those Chinese speakers that do it the way I, I described, the, um, in, the English verb, intrinsic verb, after being resected by additional markers like at, uh, wind up at this mood fulfillment place, which is what the original Chinese verb means. In turn, in a complementary way, the Chinese verb only goes so, f goes so far and then would have to add a, uh, a satellite, a, full, a realization satellite, to bring it up to what the uh, English verb means intrinsically. So that, that would be the relationship if it's true. <laughs> if it's not true, forget all this. Uh, okay, so this would be then the... Um, uh, I mean, the, by, by the way, there are, it goes on in English, uh, in, in Chinese. I mean, there are things like, uh, I don't remember the forms, but if you have forms like, um, yeah, the, bend, well, let's say wash. You can also, in Chinese, wash something dirty, can't you? Wash, wash something dirty? Well, that's impossible in, in, in English. You can't wash something dirty. Meaning to put it in water and it comes out dirtier than it was before. <laughs> that's fine? Okay. Well, you can't do that in English. You're speaking for your dialect. We're now comparing dialects. You cannot speak for all of Chinese. <laughs> uh, we've now, you are in complete agreement with the guy that I got this from. But you think it's okay? Context. Okay. In the context. I wash the shirt dirty means you, for example, uh, you washed it in a creek, in a, in a river, but the river the water was so dirty that yeah, the shirt yeah, out, yeah. came out dirtier than it was to start with. Yes. yes. That's okay? Yeah. Not for you. We agree, in fact. We, Every, we can vote on that. We can vote. <laughs> All right. How many people can say that? Uh, yes. <laughs> One, two, three, four, seven. Like five or oh, four or five over people. half, I think. Over half. Uh, over. No. Over. Look, no. you Who look. Says no. Who says no? Um, I said no. One, two, three, four. I think in more. Okay. Yeah. Well, here's another one. Uh, Not more. You have a, a, a verb to bend. I'm going to talk about bending bamboo. You can bend bamboo broken. Uh, is that okay? I bent it broken. Okay. That's impossible in English. And you can also say, I broke the bamboo bent, which means you tried to ba break it, but you only got so far as to bend it. Is that OK? Yes. OK, OK. Well, fine. At least this much is OK. I'm, I'm calling those fulfillment and underfulfillment uh, situations. And English can't do any of those. Yeah, well, for example, uh, you, one is, the way, the way I got it is, uh, if you've got a stick, which is so stiff, you try, you bend it somewhat, you try to break it, but you only got so far as bending it. It only managed, to, you didn't snap it. Um, so th to say that, apparently you say, I broke the stick bent. So zhi first, and then what's, is it one? No, duan itself means what? Bent? Means step broken, step no, no. I want the word that means bent second. The one means bent? Okay, so it would be jir one. Jir. Yeah, so jir means to try and break by, by squeezing it. You know, in fact, jir is too literal. I think I would like to use nung. No, but nung is too generic. It, it, it avoids the issue. Uh, okay. Nun is just make. I mean, too general. It's too general, yeah. Uh, let me just say a few things from the, uh, the last section, uh, which is that the, um, the, Evidence. the um, satellite, in, it, it's no surprise 
for verb-framed languages, it's no surprise that the verb should determine all sorts of things, that the verb should determine the argument structure and the, uh, the aspect and things like that, it's no, uh, the negation and so forth. That's no surprise. What's surprising if you, is when you go to satellite frame languages that it's the satellite that determines everything. So, for example, if you say uh, it determines the argument structure. So, for example, if you say um, I blew on the uh, candle, on the flame, uh, it's intransitive. But as soon as you add out, you have, then it takes a direct object. I blew out the flame. Out demands that you have, that it's transitive, it's out that that's determining this. Um, if you say uh, he ran, ran is, run is intransitive, he ran around the street, it's intransitive, but as soon as you say out, use out, I outran him, it determines, it adds a new argument, a new con it adds a new argument and, and makes it the direct object. It's the out that's doing it. Out is determining it. Um, uh, furthermore, it determines the aspect. So, for example, if you say the bottle floated uh, on the water, float as a verb is basically uh, an activity. Um, but as soon as you say across, if you say the bottle floated across the canal, you, you change you, that the across determines the, um, the aspect. You, then you'd have to say the bottle crossed the canal in. Uh, five minutes. Uh, f uh, uh, sorry, the bottle floated across the canal in five minutes. Um, so, for example, if you say in English, I didn't eat the popcorn, then in fact, no popcorn entered your mouth. But if you say, I didn't eat up, I didn't eat up the popcorn, then it means that you did eat the popcorn. Popcorn did enter your mouth. What's getting negated, what the didn't refers to, is the up. It, the target of the negation is the up. It means the completion. It means that you did not exhaust the supply of popcorn in eating. Um, the same goes with, um, uh, what's the example right after popcorn? I didn't eat half the popcorn. What's the example right after that? I mean, the police, the yeah. police didn't Oh, hunt okay. The if I say the police didn't hunt the fugitive, it means that, in fact, they just stayed in their police station. They didn't go looking for him. But if I say the police didn't hunt the fugitive down, the, neg the negation doesn't, does not apply to the hunting. They did hunt him. They did look for him. It, it applies to the satellite. It means that they didn't find him. So it's, it's again, this, the satellite, that in the satellite frame language, that is determining the aspect, most of the argument structure, um, the... Um, the upshot, what I'm using the term upshot for. And finally, in, in languages like, uh, in satellite frame languages, where the satellites often are the constituent that bears uh, so much of the content, um, uh, often those languages uh, make available a very generic verb because if you don't feel like specifying the particular call event, but you really want to get on and just get to the interesting part, the satellite, which is telling you the interesting stuff, um, you can just have a generic verb. English has them. It, has, it typically has uh, it with um, put and make and do and so forth. So like, for example, the, the candle, if out means to extinguishment, and you, want to see, you just want to use out uh, for that purpose, and you, you, you don't feel like having to pick a verb that says how it went out, like you don't want to say the candle flickered out or the candle spluttered out, well then you say the candle went out. Use go as the generic verb to fill, this, fill the, uh, the slot for the verb in order to get to the interesting part, the extinguishment part. Um, and similarly with the agentive, you would say, I, instead of saying I blew the candle out, you would just say I put the candle out. So put for uh, filling in this kind of dummy position to a placeholder. Um, similarly, I outdid him. Uh, you can say I outcooked him, means I beat him at cooking. But what you can also say I outdid him at cooking. So it's do is acting as a dummy verb. 
uh, you can say I, um, I ran off with the money, I drove off with the money, off with is the satellite complex, meaning you've stolen something and you're making your escape. That's what it means. Um, I, and if you say I ran off with the money, it means you ran. I drove off with the money, it means you drove. If you sailed off with the money, you sailed. But what if you don't want to specify which manner you used? Well, you say, I made off with the money. Uh, and, and now it's, it's a whole, um, you know. Similarly, uh, on, they talked on. You could say, I, I went, they went on talking. And German typically uses gehen uh, and machen for filling in all these verbs. So, so nachmachen, we saw nach for the imitation thing. Nachman, machen, can now act almost as a Spanish-type verb, meaning to imitate. Uh, mitmachen can mean something like to join in with. So, and I think uh, Chinese has something, you just used one, nung, is it? nung? meaning uh, it's sort of a generic causative that gets you to the interesting part. The, uh, you had nung, nung wan, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so that would be an example of one of these generic verbs that uh, just holds the, fills the marker what, until you get to the interesting content held by the satellite. Uh, so just to sum up, um, there is a, uh, a, a very pervasive pattern in, across, running across languages where uh, what is otherwise can be conceptualized as a complex uh, construction uh, involving a, a main event and a subordinate event and the relationship that the subordinate event has to the main event. Um, can all be collapsed into a single construction across a lot of languages. Uh, and within the single construction, either the, the, the crucial elements are the verb and the satellite, uh, and, and, the, and languages fall into two main typological categories on the basis of whether the, um, the main event, the core schema of the main event shows up in the verb or in the satellite. And uh, the languages tend to be consistent in using either the verb or the satellite for five distinct, distinct kinds of framing events, which they presumably are linking together on the basis of some kind of extended metaphor. Um, I, th I guess that's it. <laughs>